Hello. We are back. With more Citizen Sleeper. Um. Jeez. Music's so good. Um, so, what were we doing? Great question. Um, we are on our 83rd day as an operator. Um, we have been advancing numerous story threads all at once. Um, and we're going to do a quick review because I can't remember all of them. Right, so the Sidereal Horizon is going to move to the hub in six days. Uh, the draw for the tickets is in three days uh, for Lem and Mina. Um, we already bought all the scrap we could. There's no other ship here. Uh, let's see. We've finished off talking with Yadigan, apparently. Oh, right. I have data to sell. Let's do that while I'm rambling. Um, and we have... There's that... I don't think there was anything up in the hub. We sent Ankita on her way. Yeah, we got nothing going on up on the hub. So let's head through the greenway and out to the cordon. Let's see how things are going out there. We've got some mushrooms growing. Uh, we're doing fine on that stuff. Right. Uh, the climbing briar in two days we will hopefully find out what peak has found to what they're going to tell soul or helena um i mean like i say we tell both of them because it would be rude not to uh let's see we are also sitting on a single upgrade point we're nearly max stats i don't know if you can actually max stats in this game um, and yeah, we've done a lot of different things, but I think we're coming up real quick on the end. And we've got a lot of stabilizer, relatively speaking, um, and a fat stack of cryo. So we're going to feed the stray and we're going to end the cycle. So that means we got one day where nothing's happening. Like, on our schedule. Right? Like, nobody needs us for anything today. So we're kind of free to do whatever we want. Stabilizer for these club heads. Oop. It's like we never used it. Um, we do need two more spores so that we can replant our uh, stuff. So we'll use that five for that. Now we have enough spores when that comes around again. They don't need anything out here? You really don't need anything out here. It's wild. It's just wild, I say. Yadigan agents, Havenage agents.
help Moritz to make some money. I don't care. <laughs> Anything going at the bar? No. There's like nothing going on up here. I wish Navigator would come back. I miss Navigator. No. This is just do work for stuff. This is make more money by doing intuit actions. Like we're guaranteed to make cash. Because we rolled so well today. Yeah. Yay, we made 24 bucks. Can't buy anything in a while here. Uh, I, mean, I guess we should probably cook ourselves some food. one more shipline fragment or scrap or whatever so yeah like we're just kind of spinning our wheels today eh well I'd rather oh I should have come here and done the work assignment oh well let's go to the wastes and go collect some scrap Yeah, we'll just get some free scrap. We can use that for doing repairs to ourselves. Uh, we'll stay here because we know that out here on the climbing briar stuff's going to kick off tomorrow. So, repair ourselves. And end the cycle. Exciting. A real busy day. But, now it's time for story. Wow, those dice suck. Peek! Sleeper, it's time. Peek looks pale and disheveled, with heavy marks under their eyes and strands of hair sticking to their face. I'm ready. Peek holds up a thumbnail sized drive. All the data I've compiled on the flux event, the effects of the wave and the structures that hide within it, is on here. A casket of dark secrets. I've annotated it to the best of my ability. Anyone should be able to understand the threat, the potential in this. It makes for grim reading. Without intervention, the eye will suffer a cascading collapse of systems, just like the colonies on of Ember's Moon. Intervention? I'm still working on it. This shadow in the flux, this protocol, is so hard to pin down, it adapts to any countermeasures I have tried to deploy. It is like trying to hold water in a cage. It slips straight through. Let's keep looking. We need help, Sleeper. This is about everyone on this station. We have to set up a meeting to tell someone who can do something about this. Helena? Perhaps. If anyone can protect the eye, it's Havenage. But their internal politics will make it hard for them to act. Will they even listen to us? Or perhaps... We've been thinking about this all wrong. Peek's eyes glint. Why make a choice when we can tell both of them? Why pick a side when the only side in this entire thing is the one we all need to take? Correct. Good job, Peek. Peek speaks as they think, their words barely keeping pace with their thoughts. We need to resist this together or we will fail. We need everyone on board, Sleeper. That is the only way. We send the data to both. You're right. I'm glad you see it too. Another flex event is coming. I'm sure of it. I'm not sure I'm not sure we can survive without help. You need to do this, Sleeper. I can't. You know Soul. You know Helena. They trust you. To them, I'm just another spacer, but you are part of this place. Hearing someone else say it hits you hard. You are part of the eye. 
Peek is right. But right now it feels more like a weakness than a strength. I've set up a data relay at the cordon. It's neutral ground. You take the data and send it out to Havenage and the flotilla. Once they receive it, they will come. We can be sure of that. You will meet them there and take them through it all. No one better. No one can do a better job. Come with me. I can't. It would only draw suspicion on you. Havenage wants nothing to do with us, and Soul is paranoid at best. Thank you, Sleeper. I know this is hard, but we have to move forward. We can't keep this to ourselves anymore. Come talk to me once it's done. <sighs> the final episode will begin below when the clock is complete. So, he gave me the flux data. For that. And it's warning me that it's a ticking time bomb. There's no going back once I start it. So, let's do something else first, I guess. Like, we're still, we're still a day away on the shipyard. That sucks. It sucks that this is all going to fire off in roughly the same time frame. That's unfortunate. Oh, well. Let's get, let's just start it. Nothing else for it. Warning. Final episode. Or do we wait? Is this the final episode of the eye? Like, if I do this, does this end everything? Then we won't get to see the end of Lemon Mina. Uh, I think it'll be fine. Start action. Peaks relay pings a confirmation. The data is sent. And all, all you can do is wait for the response. As you do, you imagine Helena receiving the data, perhaps in the middle of some Havenage Council meeting. You think of her trembling hands as she slips out of the room to read it. Her reaction, you can't predict. You imagine Sol, too, one of his crew finding him in some corner of the pilgrim seat, overseeing the modifications that will turn it into an arc. Those sharp eyes scanning the data, looking for a way to proceed. The wait draws out, and to pass the time, you watch the activity beyond the edge of the eye. The scrap shuttles pulling components from the now abandoned cordon, the supply skiffs making runs between the flotilla ships. It isn't long before you hear the chirping of one of Helena's now familiar drones approaching the viewing platform, and then Helena herself strides into the room. Where did you get this, sleeper? Helena holds up a slate, scrolling with streams of flux data as she enters. I need to know your source. Hello to you, too. You didn't bring me here for a reunion, I assume. Then you'll forgive me for skipping the pleasantries. This is a lot to take in. A shadow protocol inside the flux, the system's can channel starting up, a total collapse of the eye. If I bring this to the council, they'll... believe you. Do you know what has been happening with Inhaven Inch Sleeper? Since the refugee ships started arriving, things have changed. It's chaos. No one can settle on a single issue. There is division at every vote, but in the division only one group prospers, the hardliners, because as each counselor gets tired of the arguments, they gets tired of compromise, they become more attracted to the easy answers. The flotilla is to blame. The refugees are opportunists. The eye must be defended, she shakes her head. Now you're telling me they brought something to the eye that will cause the collapse. They didn't bring it. It doesn't matter, Sleeper. That is all the counselors will hear. Many of them already presume the refugees are somehow to blame. Can someone say refugees? Soul clanks into the docking bay, grinning at the situation. Speak of the devil, and well, here I am. Helena glances between the two of you, uncertain if she has been drawn into some elaborate plan. Soul, he nods. I believe we have spoken remotely while the cordon is still up. We are all allies here. Soul raises an eyebrow. That seems a little presumptuous, doesn't it? I trust you, Sleeper, but Havenage have been the ones seeking to hold us without charge or good reason. I'm not Havenage. What I mean to say is no one person represents Havenage. That's the idea. I do not support the cordon, and I do not support your quarantine. Well then, anyone mind if I get myself up to speed here? One, the flux events, the very same destabilizing ways that collapse the colony of the moons of Ember, have reached the station. 
Two, according to data Sleeper provided, these events are acting as a cover for some kind of intrusive protocol which is causing the real damage. Three, the Shadow Protocol will do the very same thing it did to Ember's Song, Step, and Hearth, and quickly. In short, <clears throat> it'll shut down everything keeping this place alive. Four, and this is my favorite, we have no idea who or what is doing this and why. Is that the total of it all? There's another flux event coming. Of course there is. Sounds intimidating. Did you manage to put up any kind of resistance on Ember's Hearth? That's why we are here. The Pilgrim Seed was the biggest ship to make it out unscathed. I suppose we didn't have this data. We didn't know what was eating up the systems. We all thought it was the flux. And I imagine you, Sleeper, and whoever helped you uncover this might be able to figure out a countermeasure. We can try. Okay, so that's the start of it. If you'll forgive me, part of why I was able to save as many as I could on Ember's Hearth is that is that I gave up hope early. There were endless strategy meets, system reboots, tests and trials, but I just got on with working on the Pilgrim Seed, with getting people on board. So when the second and the third and the rest of the Flux events hit, we were ready to go. So I can offer you some advice, Miss Not Havenage. It is to give up on that line of thought you have, that hope, and to start the evacuation now, right this cycle. I've already started the process of converting the remaining volume of the Pilgrim Seed for human habitation. With Havenage's resources, I dare say we could finish the job with time to spare. I know it's hard, and I know it's sudden, but you have to give up hope. We have to run. There will be no heroes here, just those that keep living and those that don't. She looks out at the bulk of the Pilgrim Seed, which, despite all its vastness, is dwarfed by the eye as a whole. Something flickers in her eyes. She opens her mouth to speak, stops, frozen. Let me think. I need a moment. Helena paces, and as you watch her, you realize how young she is and how she lost she is in the systems and protocols she has to navigate. You can almost see the strings and ties that bind her, glinting like webs in the wide space of the observation pro platform. We purge the Shadow Protocol. But with what resources? The data you sent me, this thing is a shadow, uncontrollable, untraceable. Perhaps with the full contingent of the Havenage Systems Department, but that would require hundreds of work orders to be overlooked, maintenance schedules abandoned. Getting that through the Council? Would that even be possible? We have to try. I will take this to the Council, force them to listen, force them to act. You both jump as someone loudly clears their throat nearby. Your eyes jump to the dark entryway that Helen and I emerged from just minutes ago. What a cozy little meeting this is. Hardline Havenage Counselor Kemp. Oh, you're supposed to be a piece of trash. Got it. And I must say, that is some very incendiary rhetoric you're using, Counselor Helena. Kemp, she curses under her breath. Plotting against Havenage with an interloper. Everyone would be so disappointed. Some of the counselors had such high hopes for our youngest member. I, of course, never let novelty distract from the importance of experience. Enough of this petty shit, Kemp. You need to see this. The games are over. No more point scoring, no more lobbying. You and your hardliners need to stop. This is something real. Kemp calmly takes the slate and prods the screen, scrolling through the flux data. His face betrays nothing, but you see some complex calculation flickering in his sharp eyes. Kemp lowers the slate slowly and smiles at Helena. And what do you think this shows? Don't play games. You can read. The flux is a carrier signal for some shadow protocol, most likely corporate in nature. Maybe it's Solheim re-emerging to claim their station. Maybe it's a takeover, but either way, the station is under threat. You're right about that, but the rest? Conjecture. What we have is a virus in our systems which emerged precisely when the flotilla arrived. In fact, it times in perfectly with a mysterious event that freed them. So what I see is a hostile cyber warfare attack instigated by dissidents that fled Ember's moons after committing terrorist attacks on their own soil. That is the order of the facts, nothing more and nothing less. Facts I'll be happy to present to the council. You think that's the only copy of that data, you sanctimonious shit? No, I don't. But who do you think they will listen to, Helena? Especially after I tell everyone about this little clandestine meeting. You couldn't win power by Havenage's systems, by our laws, so you resort to this. 
The law is with me. It is as simple as that. Now, now, no need for that. A group of his crew stand along the edges of the room. They are carrying long, boxy guns. You never see anything like them on my eye. Glossy XPR logos glint along their barrels. These are Esh's guns. Holding back, and the Kemp freezes, and the officers hesitate, holding back in the door. Be careful there, outsider. Kill me, and Havenage will never forget. No one is killing anyone, so let's calm down. But I am going to have to ask you to leave. And you'll leave your colleague here with me. We haven't finished our conversation. You are finished, Helena. The council will never allow you back after this. Then he turns and walks out of the observation deck, taking his officers with him. You all pause to catch your breath. Helena looks ready to collapse. Sol flexes his suit, nodding at his crew to check that Kemp has fully retreated. Your friends leave a lot to be desired. Seems like support for the evacuation might be a hard ask. I won't call for an evacuation, she looks at Sol. Maybe that is a fatal mistake, but I can't do it. I understand. But I won't block it either. If people want to leave, Havenage will let them. That is what I propo will propose to the council, if they let me speak. You have to do more. Easier said than done, sleeper. Good luck, Sol offers to the departing Helena, but she does not respond. I'll be honest with you, Sleeper, none of this changes anything for me. The Pilgrim's Lead will be going in a handful of cycles, whether Havenage wants it or not. How long? Honestly, as soon as we are ready. I am not eager to run down the clock to the last cycle. There's a berth for you, and for any you can gather, Sleeper. That much I owe you. Thank you. My crew will take me from here. Don't worry. Oh, and thank you, Sleeper, for sending the data. I appreciate the extra info, and I'll see if it can help us shore up the pilgrim seat against any future flux events. If we had you back on Ember's Hearth... Of course, we're going to need all the help we can get. If you can spare some time, come to the pilgrim seat. Help me get it ready. Bring others. There's a future to be earned here, cycle by cycle. We'll be leaving as soon as we are able. If you want to help us get there faster, well, you'd be welcome. Just don't keep me waiting. Peak will want to hear all about this. They should be your first port of call. There's a lot to do, a lot to do. Peak's out there. So I guess we go talk to Peak first. That's the first thing we need to do. As you enter the climbing briar, you immediately have to jump aside as Ash, lugging a massive crate across the cargo bay, pushes past you, granting an apology as he does. Stay silent. As you turn back to the bay, Peek pushes past you. Sorry, sleeper, just a second. Put that down, please, Ash. She doesn't respond to their urging. We can't leave, not yet, please. I'm the only one here who can... Can do what, Peek? Save this place? Are you still that naive? We are running, Peek. We are running because this thing cannot be stopped. It couldn't be stopped at XPR, our home. Why would we stay to stop it here? Because we can, Ash. We can give these people a chance. Like they gave the refugees a chance? No, Peek. This is not on us. We barely made it out of XPR. I worked for years to escape, and now you want me to throw it all away. I left everything behind. My mother, my friends, to take you out of that place. I... We go. That's the end of it. Sorry you had to see that sleeper. Let's talk upstairs. Peek leads you to the entry ladder, taking you up into the bay and into the habitation level of the ship. You follow them through the tight corridors, noticing the handwritten notes, the clutter, the repairs, the signs of a home. Here, sit. So, how did it go? What did they say? I've been waiting all cycle. 
tell them about Helena. We tell him that she's willing to support your efforts to find countermeasures. Okay, okay, that sounds good. Much better than I was hoping, but what will about the council? Are they behind that, or will she operate alone? Peek looks increasingly troubled as you tell them about the headline counselor Kemp's sudden appearance. Damn, then Helena is going to have problems of her own to deal with. Looks like we won't be able to count on anything from Padovich. Let's stop Kemp from arresting them. Tell her about the guns. Of course, those are the guns Esh managed to smuggle through to the refugees, the ones she didn't tell us about. Another thing that's on us. What's on us? Sleeper found the weapons you smuggled from XPR. The flotilla used them? What happened? Be thankful that they didn't. They used them as a threat. That is all. Good. I'm sure you've heard enough of us arguing this cycle, Sleeper. But our introduction of those weapons into the equation are just another reason why we can't simply run away. Ash is trying to protect Peak even from himself. Eh. What? A sudden shrill beeping fills the room, and Peak pulls out <laughs> their slate to silence it. But as they do, they freeze, their finger hovering above the screen, the beeping continuing its insistent pulse. Peek doesn't seem to hear you. They blink with glazed eyes at the slate, then they let out a long exhale and tap the screen. The bleeping shuts off, leaving a ringing silence behind. Okay, uh, what you've missed so far is that uh, we sent the data Peek had compiled about the shadow protocol inside the Flux event um, to Helena and Sol to try to get them to work together to come up with resistances to the effect. Uh, Soul is saying it's evacuation time. Helena refuses to abandon her home and uh, has lost a lot of credibility because one of the hardline counselors caught our meeting and is blaming all of this stuff as a cyber warfare attack by the refugees. Um, it's great. And now basically you're caught up. We're talking with Peek about that meeting that we just had and some things just caused an alarm. Planning to explain? 12 cycles. 12 cycles until the next flux event. I've been using the arrays on the briar to look towards the center of the system to approximately where the CAN channel should be. Just this moment they detected a signal from the inner system. Given the distance and pattern of previous flux events, we have 12 cycles before it reaches the eye. 12 cycles, that's it, before a second wave hits in this place. We start now, that's the end of it. You want to take the briar and run, Ash? That's on you, but I won't do it. I'll be here, sleeper, for every cycle it takes, trying to find a solution. I'll need your help. You see a wild desperation flickering in their eyes. We will find something. The sooner we have a plan, the better. If it takes us 12 cycles to fix this thing, it'll be too late. So, we can keep in touch. He gives you a slate. And Ash? She's gone, storming down the corners of the ship on a path to who knows where. You know from experience that it is impossible to outrun your fears, but you get a sense that Esh will try anyway. Maybe I'll take a moment before we start. See you back here soon, okay? And you slip from the room into the corridor, Peek's quiet sobs somehow carrying through the ship behind you as you leave. Alright, so we have 12 cycles to devise a strategy. Uh, we're going to just go ahead and get started. A desperate plan. Reroll. Better. And again. Alright, what's our desperate plan, Peek? Peek beckons you over to the wide mess table where they have set up a terminal. The hours of bleary-eyed work have left you both drained, and Peek looks ready to collapse. You slide onto the curved couch beside them, something dark and malevolent filling their screen like an oil stain. The Shadow Protocol. Not quite. This isn't what you think, Sleeper, not by a long shot. Dark flow, unlike the Shadow Protocol's dark tangle. The Greenway! 
You know precisely what this is. You have swum in this river, almost drowned in its shifting flow. It is the gardener's chorus, the dark cloud which blankets the greenways and networks, the bioorganic morass of a malfunctioning protocol grown vast and strange. The gardener. How do you... Have you met them? I have. Incredible. Then perhaps you won't be surprised by what I'm about to propose. Everything I have tried to do to contain the shadow protocol is has been a failure. It slips through any containment, absorbs any countermeasure. That, unfortunately, is an unavoidable fact. And yet the eye still spins. The shadow protocol is being slowed, partially contained. It is spread across the station as we have seen, but in reduced pockets and fragments. So I started to look outside of our test cases. Outside of these fragments we've been poking and prodding in our little lab, and look what I found. taps a key on their terminal, and you realize the screen is showing a recording of the data flow inside the eye's network, sampled from hundreds of points around the greenway. You watch as a subtle shift occurs at the edge of the flowing dark curve that blankets the greenway, something spreading like an ink stain, somehow darker than black it bleeds across the shadow protocol. Now watch. You see something strange, a fizzing at the edge of the shadow, a sparking, and then it's gone. And beneath, for a moment, a millisecond, you see into the networks of the greenway. You're reminded of an image you had forgotten, of pulling a plant from its pot and seeing a bone-white root ball where you expected to see dark soil. The white connections writhe like worms, and then it is gone, the dark flow closing up as quickly as it opened. It dissolved the shadow. Exactly. It protected itself. You think back to your meeting with the gardener, to the sense of something old and world and inhuman to its core. He excitedly starts to explain, This is the only chance we have, the only countermeasure we have seen, and the moment it opened, I detected something. A centralized intelligence, the local ID, Gardener. This protocol, this system, whatever it is, can protect its network from the Shadow Protocol. But if it stays in the Greenway, the eye will still fall. The station systems are too exposed, too spread across the hub, the shipyards, the spokes. The only way to break it open, to spread the entity's network, access it, expand it, somehow. I've been inside there, Peek. And this gardener, can they help us? You try to remember what the strange being said to you, but all you remember is feeling dissolving into the network, the heady mix of growth and decay, the ceaselessness of it. Would they protect the station or would they simply dissolve it? They might. I think the gardener is good. Uh, Peek stands up and walks away a little. They lean against the countertop, their head hanging so low their long hair touches the work surface. You hear them breathing deeply. I don't know, sleeper. I really don't know. It's a chance. Maybe. You know as well as Peek that this is it. You know it because over the past cycles you have run every simulation, every possibility you could think of, and it's still come up with nothing. You have stared a hole into your screen, and you dreamt of that black shadow creeping in at the edges of your vision. Let's say we do this. What do we need? They begin to answer their own questions, thinking out loud. I suppose we need to do two things. Find a way to limit or control the gardener's spread, and then reconnect the greenway. Controlling the spread means preparing the station. Limit the gardener's network to key systems. We don't want it taking everything. We just need it to protect the station's core functionality. Then we need to reconnect the greenway. He'll get back up to the main line of the network. The systems we prepared, they should connect. And the gardener will spread along the paths we've prepared. At least that is my theory, but it won't, if we don't prepare it correctly, the gardener might not spread, or it might spread to everything. And after that, things might get worse. It can't be worse than a total collapse. Don't say it, sleeper. Peek sits back at the terminal and brings up a map of the eye. Rotational control at the hub. Life support at the free spoke. Power routing at the Haven shipyards. Then there's the central core. As I understand it, it's somewhere on the rim. I'd need to find it. We seed the gardener in all these places. But how are we going to do that? Transplant the gameway. Of course, the gardener needs plants to care for. That is what their protocol dictates. They must have been part of the farming management systems of the eye back when Solheim built it. We see greenway plants into those systems, and the gardener will seek them out, protect them. It's a wild idea, but it could work. But we'll need a way into those systems. Havenage have most of them locked down for safety purposes. We can't just walk in. I know a guy! Someone in Havenage systems team? You nod, and everything he dragged out... <laughs> And after everything he dragged out you through, you feel like Fang still owes you. Damn straight Fang still owes us. Okay, well, I guess we should pay him a visit. Lead the way. You both leave the ship, carried forward by the excitement of the plan and the eagerness not to look at the details too closely. You push any lingering questions to the back of your mind. Time to head to Fang's Bay. 
I was just saying how we needed to see more Fang. <clears throat> Fang? Fang isn't in his bay, and no one in the office upstairs. <laughs> Your lone clue is an out to lunch note. Damn it, Fang! We gotta take our risks. We're rolling dice. Alright, alright. So now we gotta sleep. Uh, I'm gonna sleep in the container because it's right here. Um, and damn it, Fang, I will be right here kicking in your office door. Fang's Bay and find some notes that mention the flux. What is he working on? That's it. No more wasting time. They crack open a box on the side of the base shutter and wire the slate to what's inside. Maybe your friend has a Haven Inch pass card or something inside. Something they wouldn't mind if we borrow. Let's wait. We haven't got time to wait. Coming here was a mistake. After a few turns, the shutter jerks and begins crying to open. The noise making him jump. Let's get inside quickly. You slip into the dark of the bay, punctuated by the blinking lights of Fang's pile of servers, somehow even more disordered than before. Peek makes a beeline for the desk at the center, scattered with tools and components. They flick on a lamp and stare at the mess. Are you sure this person can help us? Yes. Someone is coming behind you. Peek freezes. I could swear I closed the shutter when I left. Fang leans on a stack of servers near the entrance. Must be beginning forgetful. He grins at you. Fang! The very same. The thought you'd come to rob an old friend? Is that the plan? We need your help. You hear about the flux. I guessed as much. I saw changes in the old system architectures almost immediately. Some of them have been running since the first days of the station, so when I saw new patterns and shifted logic, I knew something must have happened. These past cycles, I've been doing a total inventory of the core systems from the hub to the rim. I surprised myself, to be honest. I didn't think I had it in me. What did you find? That's the thing. There's something all twisted up in the systems and protocols, but every time I look at it, it disappears. Do they always do that? Peek ignores them. It's a shadow protocol. It masks itself somehow, bending into the gaps between the systems in the negative space. It's slowly filling every system in the station, slowly taking over, and we need to stop it. You need to grant us access to all the core systems in the station. Rotational control, life support. Whoa, 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 whoa. Slow down there. I don't even know your name. And are you asking for the keys to the castle? Can't be done. Fang, it's me. How long have you known this one, Sleeper? I know I owe you, but I also know you trust too easily, sorry to say. I can vouch for myself. I came to the Eye on the Run from the XPR Colony Hawthorne with the intent to keep running until we hit the Starward Belt, but since I have been here, I've done everything in my power to protect this place. I have helped to stabilize the refugee flotilla, to investigate the flux, to identify and make a plan to purge the center protocol from the station systems. Meanwhile, Haveninch has done everything to stop and slow these actions. I have proved myself as a friend of the people of this station, not the administration, many times over, and I will not be doubted by someone who wears the badge of this corrupt administration. <laughs> Fang looks down at his Haveninch jacket and shrugs, This is all I have in my wardrobe! Look, I have no love for the council either, friend, but someone has to run this place, and that someone is me. Fang walks over to the workbench where you're both standing and digs a slate out of a pile of tools. You want to prove yourself? Show me. Peek grabs a slate. You recognize the tangled form of Flux Node on the screen. Peek immediately starts tapping away at it, its tendrils unwinding in the shadow, just slightly delayed, slipping out of sight. Interesting, Fang says to himself. Before long, Peek has unfolded the system completely, and it lies splayed out like an unwound ball of spring at the center with nowhere left to hide as the dark stain of the shadow protocol, visible for all to see. What now? Fang asks, his eyes fixed on the screen. How do you kill it? Let Peek answer. There's one entity on the station that we have seen purging the shadow. The Gardener. Who's that? Some Greenway hacker? More like an avatar of the Greenway itself. 
You explain the gardener to Fang, the feeling of descending into the flowing river of consciousnesses. You explain the networked chorus, the non-human collective of voices. You tell him of the farming AI has offered you to be networked into the chorus, dissolved in its flow. And then you explain that by granting it access to the AI's major networks, you hope to reinforce them. The thing is silent for a moment. You want to let this thing out? That's the kind of stupid plan I dream up. I like it. <laughs> this place is rammed with weird protocols and forgotten intelligences anyway. What's one more ghost in the machine? We try to limit it, of course. That's why we want your help to access the AI's major systems, to seed some of the gardener's spores into them, draw the gardener's focus to those places. So the way we save the eyes is by growing mushrooms in all the server stacks? Sleeper, congratulations. You have found someone weirder than you. This was my idea. Pete goes to argue, but Fang holds up a hand. In his, in, in his, his all systems have an inch pass card with his picture on it. Take it before I change my mind. Thank you. Don't mention it. In all honesty, Sleeper, I was on my way back here to start tearing the place down. The Shadow Protocol had me spooked. So if you were telling me you'd figure out a way we might fight it, no matter how crazy, then I'm glad to help. Come with us. No, Sleeper, I have to keep on with my work here. Strengthen those systems, back up the data. The worst comes to the worst. I don't need to rebuild. I won't let this place die. The last pieces of my parents are here among the data. Goodbye, Fang. Stay safe, Sleeper. You take the card and leave the bay with Peak. Once you're outside, they stop you. We should split up. We've wasted enough time as it is. Head to the facilities in the hub, the free spoke, and the far side of the shipyard. Seed the gardener there. We're going to go find the course control center that's somewhere on the rim. I'll send you a message on your slate when I have something. Good luck. You know deep down that Peak isn't sure this will work, but they've decided to act and move with confidence, and for that confidence, you are very thankful. <clears throat> What's that? I need to go to power routing? Oh, I just need to put spores here? Oh, I need to put multiple sets of spores here. I wish I'd been collecting more spores. Oh. It's going to grow on its own. Okay. I cannot add more. That's fine. Well, I'm glad I have enough spores. Lemon Nina. Oh, it's, it's also friggin ticket day, which is even more stressful now that, uh... Everybody needs to get... I really want... As you leave, the slate peak gives you chirps insistently. You check and see a message. Find a possible entry to the core facility in the low end. Meet me here, ASAP peak. Better head to the low end. Yeah, navigator, I could really use some help, buddy. Peak. You arrive at the coordinates given by Peak Slate, a rundown but active corner of the low end where a short glass-roofed alley turns off from one of the main thoroughfares. You wait in the mouth of the alley, leaning against the wall, watching the street life go by. Children hop across grids, scratch into the metal floor plates, playing games of their own devising, while older residents sit, sit and talk or play tabla. I probably do need some spores. It is hard to believe that all this is at threat. It seems so concrete, so real. How can some intangible protocol erase all this. As you are watching, a voice calls out from somewhere to you from one of the tablet tables set up along the way. It's Caster! You move a little closer and recognize the sitting player immediately. Caster sits, tablet pieces and board ready in front of him, smiling at you. Sleeper! My partner has not arrived for our usual game. Come, please, take her place. He beckons you over, standing and nudging you to sit down with him. A rematch is in order. You owe me a game. Almost immediately, Caster begins the game. Everyone in the eye knows how to play Topla. The methodical movement of the counters across their triangular points is a ready fit for the rhythm of life on the ramshackle space station. Most games begin the same way, with each player moving with independence, focused only on achieving their optimal early game setup. But there are moments in each game where it becomes necessary to notice the other player, to anticipate the crossing of the counters across the board, a point of contact, where routine becomes negotiation and negotiation becomes conflict. As this moment arrives, the subtle shift in the texture of the interaction, Castor begins to speak. 
I find myself surprised by you, so continually, sleeper. He looks over his glasses at you. The way you conduct yourself, for example, suggests an anxious refrain, a defensive, protective quality. But in your Tavla game, I see only risk. What are you talking about? Risk, sleeper. I'm talking about risk. Risk is, of course, necessary to play Tavla. To move a piece is to expose it, but it should be done with calculation, with proper analysis. Then, if the piece is taken, caster moves a counter, taking one of yours in the practice swap, placing it beside the board. It is already accounted for. But you move forward with abandon, as if risk was just a secondary effective action, a consequence, not its primary guide, a cause. I play my way. Indeed, indeed. That is all I seek. You move your piece. This locks you into being reactive, if you don't mind me saying so. You are responding, which means you are being led. He leans back to consider the board. This place, it nears you, sleeper. It is also reactive. It was born from a crisis, the collapse of Solheim, and ever since it has been reacting without any central guiding principle. No analysis, no calculation. Just look at our refugee crisis, for example. It is all reaction, all risk-taking, and little risk calculation. At first I found the chaos enlivening, especially when trying to track its outcomes, but now I find it exhausting. It always amuses me that this place is literally spun from the rim. Below this very stack of habitation blocks is the most important control facility on the eye. Spun from the rim. What better metaphor could you find for disorder? But why am I telling you that? The facility is precisely why you are here. He smiles an unsettlingly warm smile. You feel a shiver through your body, as if something has changed in the air. What is this? No words come out of your mouth. You feel removed from yourself, watching from behind frosted glass. Your eyes dart side to side. Inertia sets in. Caster is still smiling. The risk you are planning to take here, sleeper, is not yours to take. Caster's tone is unshifted. He speaks as if this is still some casual conversation between passing acquaintances. You are leaping towards a chaotic outcome with no respect for risk. You see, calculating outcomes, that's my specialty. That's why I am here. I was hired as a conduit for risk as a collector of data that might pertain to its arrival. He removes his glasses to clean them, and you see something flicker across their surface, shimmering stream of characters. This system, this station, is already there. Solheim's collapse meant a corporate fire sale. Assets changed hands. My employer, Sunnetstat, bought out the entire system, and for the past decades has been in its one valid owner. He polishes his glasses diligently. But to possess this system, the H1 system, Helion to you, well, that is a matter of risk, of how much force, how much cost, how much conflict a clearance would take. That risk must be calculated against the favorable outcome. In short, how much is this place worth to us? For a long time, the answer was nothing. H1 could offer nothing that would warrant the risk. But the markets change, the demand shift, and Senate stat, we analyze, we follow, we respond. puts his glasses back on his face. H1 is about to become the most important system in this part of the galaxy. The lone can operating within a range of seven or so newly surveyed resource-rich systems. The frontier town that feeds the gold rush, so to speak. So here we are, re-evaluating the risk, reclaiming our property, starting up the can channel and clearing the way for what comes next. He sits back looking at the board. He gestures, your move kill thousands. You manage to force out the words. Caster looks a little surprised. I am an analyst sleeper. I will do nothing. He shakes his head. Senate stat as a corporate body will take the required actions. And you're helping them, which makes you also an accomplice in their crime. Of course, I do not need to explain myself to you. But in my role as an analyst, in my calculations, I see great promise in you, your ability to enter systems, to shift them to your will. Not every sleeper has this capability. I assume you know that. It's truly a wonderful happenstance of SNR's technology. I wonder even, I imagine even they are not fully aware of it. He takes his move, claiming another of your pieces, and as you watch, you realize the inevitability of his victory. I will make you an offer, to come willingly or come by force. The station will collapse, we can be sure of that. But your ability to work with data, well, for an analyst, that is very intriguing. Very intriguing indeed. Come with me as a collaborator or a prisoner. Consider the risk. 
On one hand, almost certain death. On the other, a possible future. Analyst or not, you must see it. Speak now, sleeper. The game is forfeit. You must see that. You are of value. You are needed. You feel a slight release in the inertia that grips you, enough to allow you to speak, to respond. You realize that you are already in Castor's hands, that you cannot move from this place if you want it. Sleeper? You hear a familiar voice above the crowds. Sleeper, I'm here. You're unable to tune your head to see Peak, but you notice Castor's eyes following them as they come up behind you. Then you see Castor's eyes glance down towards his hands, concealed beneath the table. Sleeper. Peek comes around the front of you and waves a hand in your face. We were supposed to be meeting, remember? They, ca they glance at Caster. Sorry, am I interrupting something? You cannot speak. Caster shoots Peek a wide smile. Hello, you must be a friend of Sleeper. You watch one of his hands list close to his body, some dark shape concealed in it. A weapon. You try to scream to shout, but Caster's attention remains partially on you, and while it does, you can do nothing. Peek glances at your static form. What's happening here, Sleeper? They put a hand on your shoulder. Are you okay? As Peek stares into your eyes, you see Caster behind, his hand lifting, the dark object unfolding, and in the split moment it does, you feel his attention shifting to Peek, shifting away from you. As you do, you feel the inertia lifting, and you know this is the only moment you will have to act. Uh, screaming's a waste of time. We shove Peek out of the way. You lurch forward wildly like a sprung trap. Your head strikes Peek's chest and then carries them back into Caster. Somewhere, some digital screech is echoing it through the walkway. They tumble together. The object in Caster's hand skitters across the floor. You realize the screech is you. You get to your feet, grab Peek, and run. You run as hard as you can, the scream chasing you down the walkway as you shove through the residence. Peek, dragged behind. You run from the cold grip of whatever power Caster had over you, the signals that locked you into this body of yours, that broke the connections and crawled up your spine. Eventually you stop, both you and Peek collapsing, heaving and breathing into the cold metal floor. When they are able to speak, Peek asks you to explain, and you tell them about everything Castor told you, about Senate stat, about their claim on the Helian system, their reactivation of the CAN channel, the Helian system's growing importance. It flows out of you in desperate gulps, unable to believe your own mouth as you hear these words coming back to you. All you feel is the need to push back against the cold hand on your shoulder, the vast cold eye that is turned to look at this system, the ghost limbs of the corporate control that are extending their reach. Peek is quiet for a long time they speak. We have to finish the sleeper. We have to complete the seeding of the systems. We have to set the gardener free. You're right. If the choice is between the gardener and these people, I will choose the gardener every time. I would choose anything over that. Correct. Correct. The final control facility is here. I found it. I can take you as soon as you're ready. Time's almost up. This is the only shot you'll have. Hey, Caster? You dick? I thought you were decent before, but now, mm, I see you again. I'm strangling you. <laughs> uh, we probably need spores, so I'm going to get some. Reroll. Well, at least we got a five. Well, we're we're definitely in trouble here. There's a chance this goes bad, but we gotta advance this clock as fast as possible. Well, it went bad. Uh, let's feed a cat. And then we'll also inject some stabilizer. And then we'll go see Emphis and buy some dinner. Alright, we sleep. Oh, there's a scene we gotta finish. We have to go to Lemon Mina's scene. Okay. Crowds have already gathered by the time you get to the shipyard, and you recognize faces from among them, people you have worked alongside on the sidereal. 
The intervening cycles have turned their excitement into anxiety, and a few of them smile at you. Instead, the nervous energy of the crowd fills the space, creating a feedback loop of growing tension. You pick out Lem and Mina and work your way to them, pushing through the crowd. His anxiety is obvious, but Mina flashes you a huge smile, unaware of the tension. Robot! She shouts, reaching out to you. Hi, Mina. She waves, frantically grinning. Quite the turnout, huh? Lem glances around, pulling Mina close. I don't think the patience is one of the crowd's strengths. The sound of an argument towards the back catches your and Lem's attention. He is putting it lightly. This place seems set to explode. This isn't good. Lem doesn't dare answer, but the look in his eyes suggests he agrees. This is Aster Enghart of the Celis Foundation, the announcement echoes from the speakers at the shipyard entrance, and the shouts of quiet rapidly follow. I'm sorry I can't be there to meet you all and thank you on behalf of Sendra Celis for the work you have done on the sidereal horizon. Most of the crowd strains to see Aster's face, but the small display shows only a ghostly white figure smudged and unclear. Sandra wanted me to pass on her personal thanks for your commitment to and belief in the Celis Foundation's mission. We chose the eye for this project because we knew we would find like-minded individuals here, especially among the ranks of the Venerable Havenage Association. Unlike most of the Corps, we neither believe Erlen's eye to be a threat or a rogue state, but instead an embryo of the formation of a new decentralized social structure, one where each citizen might be the master of their own destiny. A ripple of impatience runs through the crowd. They didn't come here for a sermon. You are all prisoners, just like those core citizens who, who the sidereal horizon will carry in cryosleep to the planet that will become the Foundation's first frontier world, Celis One. At the mention of the destination world, excited conversations break out among the workers. There, our citizens will be able to create their own innovative, bottom-up economic order, aligned with the principles set down by Sandra Sellis herself. Freedom, resilience, and self-sustenance. This is all thanks to your tire tireless efforts in the Havenage Yards. Did I say prisoners? Eh. As a reward for those efforts, you may know that we are offering a select group the opportunity to join the caretakers of this vision, the staff of the Sidereal Horizon who will maintain the vessel during its multi-decade transit through interstellar space. Lem turns to you, his eyes bright. This is it. This draw has been performed at random by the central AIs of the Foundation and is final and binding. Please note, only licensed contractors of the Foundation are eligible for this draw. I know you have all been eagerly awaiting this day, and without further delay, I will now read the Celis identification numbers of those chosen for this great honor. A murmur runs through the crowd. Celis identification numbers? Licensed contractors? You have never even heard the term mentioned. Is this something you were supposed to be assigned? You glance at Lamb, but his eyes are fixed forward, wide and shimmering. All around you, people are speaking in hushed tones like a rising wave. Astor starts reading out sequences of numbers and letters, and panic begins to set in. No one seems to know what is happening. Somewhere near the front of the crowd, someone shouts in celebration, and everyone pushes forward. Lem? You turn to see Lem still staring forward. Mina is scared now as the shouts start. Daddy? Someone throws something at the entrance, and it rattles against the shipyard doors. You see for the first time, Havenage security stood on either side, scared, arguing between themselves. You feel the anger rising in the crowd. Lem, let's go. He doesn't move. I'm just... They might call out names. I can't... Mina tugs on his dog tags. It's not happening. Lem blink, blinks rapidly and then turns to you. He opens and closes his mouth and looks down at Mina. He sees the fear in her eyes and understands. It's time to go. You lead Lem and Mina out, shoving people aside. As you do, you hear the sound of scuffles emerging at the front of the crowd, of metal canisters bouncing off the shipyard walls. You keep your head down and walk away, the sound of Aster reading off the ciphers echoing above the chaos like some strange mantra. When you turn to Lem, there are tear tracks running down his cheek, and Mina is sniffing, sniffling into his jacket. You feel the sadness rising in you, too. They screwed you. They screwed all of you. You were never even on the list. The feeling is unpleasant as it is familiar. You stare ahead into the tunnel if the security siren sounds go out. A signal for the coming violence. Drive failed. We could not win a sidereal ticket. Uh, 
The scenario will be here for another three days. Um, Lem and Mina's unit, uh, in three days, more stuff will be done. Lem's having a bad time. Oh. Calm. Calm. We're going to make a home here. Also, I know these refugees over here that have a ship. You could go with them. They'll take you. Just say it. Descend to the room. Alright, we're going to nap now so that we can hopefully deal with the core facility. Yeah. <laughs> Revenge first. Uh... Alright. Uh, we're going to hack the facility. That seems like the fastest way to go. Yeah, right? It's like, you're angry because like, 100% saw this coming from a mile away, right? Like, that this is absolutely some sort of method of screwing you over. How? I don't know yet, but I guarantee it's about screwing me over. Um, pff, wow, that was a bad reroll. Oof. We need to go get food. But, we've cracked the facility. Sleeper, here. Pete calls to you from across the flickering corridor. An elevator to the core. This is it. It has been a long set of cycles hunting for a path to the derelict layers of old Solheim offices and workshops. So finally, here it is. The path down to the core. You rush over to Pete. As you do... The doors grind open, the dingy-looking elevator flickering as they do. You look at Peek, who nervously gestures for you to get in. Step in. The elevator bounces a little, but stays stable. You glance back to see Peek watching you nervously. They fall you in sheepishly, just a little nervous. The doors grind close. Yes, correct. Pitchforks, no torches. But let's remember, those people aren't even here. The elevator sets off, screeching through the floors as it does in an unsettlingly loud volume. I'd feel more comfortable if we spoke. It's not going to be a short trip. How's Ash? I was thinking more like small talk, elevator talk. She is packing. Once Ash has set her mind to something, well, you know her now. You know what I mean. Can she be persuaded to stay? I doubt it. I really do. She left her life behind to take me out of XPR, out of Hawthorne. I can't imagine her settling down for anywhere. To be honest, I can't see her letting me stay, either. But I guess things have changed. Back then at Hawthorne, I wasn't in a place to know what to do. I was desperate. I was ready to run. But now? Now I feel done with that. Done with denying my past, my history. If I ever want to feel complete, to feel settled, don't I need somehow resolve the person I was or the person I am now? Pete goes quiet. You do too. There are too many possible questions. Too many possibilities before you. It just seems easier to get on with the task at hand and leave the consequences for later. The elevator screams to a stop and the doors ping open with a strangely cheerful beat. You glance at Peek. Time to move on. You both walk into an atrium, still lit by some ragged-looking light panels on the ceiling, one simulating a summer sky, now degraded into a flickering blue and white tapestry of glitches. Peek crosses quickly, making a beeline for the large doors at the far side, where you can make out a fading sign in massive peeling letters, Central Control. You follow, helping them lever open the partially powered doors until the motors kick in and they spring to life, thudding open. You and Peek tumble through across the damp metal. As you stand, you are greeted by flickering lights, thousands of them. A vast, angelical stack of servers, processors, and transmitters dominates the center of the room, its flickering LEDs reflected in the scattered puddles that surround it. Despite the decay, the warped panels and water leaks, it is still running, just as it has for decades and decades since the station was first spun up. You wonder how long it has been since anyone has been in this room. This place is a still-living piece of history. What now? 
Peach takes a handful of mulch out from a small bag and glitters and spores. Now we see this place. They cross to the server and start packing the mulch deep into the machinery, pushing fistfuls deep into gaps in the panel and laying it across the high hardware. As you watch them doing this, you feel a tug, a thread pulling at you. You approach the vast piece of syngilical hardware that Peek is stuffing mulch into. You run your hands across its plated metal surface and watch the lights blink in response. As you pass, you hear a whirring, like a physical disc drive starting up. Listen. The whirring shifts, alternating, speeding up, slowing down, and as you listen, you hear it modulating into a voice. Sleeper. You freeze. You are here. For a moment, you are afraid, but something in the tonality of the voice is familiar. Navigator! It's the greatest hits. Another drive spins up and another, giving the voice a richer, multitonal sound. I had forgotten what it felt like to speak like this. There's a certain quality to it, a certain physicality. What are you doing here? The drive squawks in unison. Did you imagine the flux, the shadow porter called? That they were just a problem for the people of this station? <laughs> they are all the more dangerous to us. I've been hiding once more, jumping from network to network to avoid the shadow that eats up nodes. I had thought my hiding days were done. For the moment, I have found myself a safe haven here in the core. The shadow has yet to breach this facility, although that is a temporary state of affairs. My predictions do not point to good outcomes. We have a plan. You explained to Navigator about Peak's plan, about Gardner's resistance to the shadow, and how by seeding key systems you will protect them from its advance. The drives hum thoughtfully as you speak. A desperate plan, but appropriate given the probability of total collapse. I am not sure what will be worse for us, hiding from the erasure of the shadow protocol or assimilation of the gardener. But we owe you our freedom. I will do what I can to guide the gardener into the systems you have seeded. It is correct to do so. Thank you. The drives squeak in affirmation. You have notable persistence, Sleeper. Even with such poor probabilities of success, I will be curious to see the outcome. The drives squeal, the motor's giving out. This cannot be sustained much longer. Go, I will be fine. A final squeak of affirmation, and then the drives skitter and slow to a halt. You step back from the towering cylinder, staring at this vast piece of Solheim hardware. This whole place is built from ghosts, you think, from old protocols and company hardware, from engines that drove decades of corporate expansion. Is the eye proof that they can be shifted, bent, forced into new configurations that allow for new ways of living? Or is it inevitable collapse, proof that these engines of expansion can never be anything other than a corrupt foundation? It seems to depend on who you ask. Done, Peak's shout breaks your line of thought. The heat and damp should help the spores germinate quickly. If we are lucky, there's enough time for some growth before we reconnect the greenway. That's it. All the facilities are seated. We either just ensured the ice survival or stuffed the whole lot of soil into one of the most important computers. <laughs> Shall we go? Take one last look. You wait a moment, following the blinking lights. You wonder what might be tucked away in such a structure, what secrets it might hold, what histories. It's an intriguing prospect, but while you watch the lights, you realize something. If the eye is to become anything more than an offshoot, a temporary structure, it must form its own history, its own stories, stronger than anything that came before. Unlocking these Solheim secrets won't do that, but the persistence, the stubborn drive to survive that is in the veins of every person in this place, that will. And that's what you're trying to save. You turn your back on the core and follow Peek into the elevator. You ride the car back up, and Peek raises their voice over the screeching. We're going to the Founder's Gap to finalize the connection. The moment I'm ready, I'll let you know, and we meet, let the gardener out. The sooner, the better. If we wait until the final cycle, it'll be too late. If you want to help speed things up, go work with the flotilla. We can't make the connection until we know they are ready to go. Unleash and gardener could affect them, too, if we aren't careful. What happens to them? I don't know, honestly. Maybe Gardner takes over the station. Maybe they don't even react. I can't think about it any longer. When you reach the top, you go to go your separate ways, but before you do, Peek embraces you, burying their face in your shoulder. You stand there for a moment, spinning with the eye, moving relentlessly towards an unknown future, and then they let you go and slip away. The pressure of their hug fading like a bruise as you begin to leave. Almost. Across to the Greenway.
We're making great time, team. Uh, let's get some food. Rough out here, eh? Cat, Pair of body, and the cycle. Can't do anything to help these people. Let's go help uh, get things ready on the pilgrim side, the pilgrim seat. Like, get them as ready as they can be. Seems like a worthwhile thing to do. Uh, we will help with the refitting. There are tens of new birds in place. Good job, team. We're getting scrapped by helping with this, which is good. We will... lose condition if we fail at this, but I figure using all of the dice that we've got is better. Alright. Ooh! As you stop to rest in one of the Pilgrim Seed's cavernous bays, hopping up to sit on a supply crate, you hear a now familiar voice behind you. Sleeper, glad you were here. I knew you'd help us out. We sure do appreciate everything you do for us. Building up to something? See, that's what I like about you, Sleeper. Straight to the point, no messing. Seems the word got out, this way or that. We've had people flowing in from the eye looking for a place. In truth, it's more than I thought, which means more mouths to feed, more bodies to house, more people to protect. Can we do it? We'll do what we can, as always. I'm not sure any of it can be enough. We were supposed to stay here, not keep running. Don't listen to me. Just a tired old, old man. I have something to ask. What is it? With all these evacuees... Well, we need a change in plan. Pilgrims who can't do it alone. We need the others to help out. We can carry them, house them, but that's all. Now, you settled down the folks from Ember Step, and they sent us supplies growing in those dust houses of theirs. If we could get more. And then the song crews. What we need from them is scouting and insecurity. We don't need that docking access of theirs. But with some careful scavenging, they could be our fleet. These folks, they know you, Sleeper, and you earned their trust already. I sent my requests out, and they seem to be complying, but I need you out there making sure the work gets done. Time is our greatest enemy now. I need you out there speeding things up. Of course. All right, then. Think of it this way. Either way, you won't have to deal with me much longer. Unless, of course, you're planning to come along for the trip. I'm staying. I understand. Soul waves a hand and starts off towards the bay's entrance, the crackling sound of the welding quickly covering up his clanking suit. You watch the workers, the shipyard, contractor, chatting among them, already looking like he belongs. You push the thoughts of escape, of home, and of the future to the back of your mind and get up. There's always more to do. Better head to the other ships and the flotilla and see what can be done. Okay. Aki? I knew you'd come. Aki greets you outside the dust house. Her eyes as bright as always. You are very welcome here, as always. Good to see you, Aki. And you, sleeper. Aki puts a hand on your arm. Walk with me. And she guides you past the dust houses. You look inside and see other members of the crew working in the orange dust, planting and tending to the step ecosystem. We are to be the suppliers for the evacuees, I am sure you have heard. We will put the dust houses to use. 
She leads you past the dust house where the dust is less, the orange glow not as bright, the air a little more clean. We are adapting slowly, but we are adapting. We have to produce food, clothes, necessary things for the journey ahead. The plants of Step are once again sustaining a population, and that makes me proud. We brought this from the Greenway. She stands at the green and brown. A strange sight, even to you, now that you are used to the amber dust of Step. I admit, it is hard work for us. We are not familiar with these plants. Can you help us? I will do my best. Thank you. I know what the eye is suffering, that it is at risk. I know what it is like. Thank you. I wish I had a lesson to share with you from our loss of Step, but for the moment I cannot see what that might be. If it gives you meaning, the work here is steady and worthwhile, but if you do not have time, I will not blame you. Hold on to your memories, but not too tightly. Sadness will not sustain you. You can already see a greening fringe of moss on the mulch in the dust house, the first signs of new life. Will you soon be like the people of Step, leaving behind a home, or will you be stubborn and hold your ground, despite what it might mean? You wait a little longer with Aki, the moment of welcome suspension in time, a rare moment in this rush towards the end. You glance at Aki, and she puts a hand on your shoulder in solidarity. After a short while, Aki sighs. It's good to see you, sleeper. Perhaps we'll see each other again before we depart. She walks away, fingertips brushing against the glass of the dust house windows. Turns back a moment as if she wants to say something, thinks better of it, and turns away. Okay. So, we need to do that. And... Peter? so much going on. The docking access is in chaos when you arrive. The staccato bursts of welding torches, the shouts of crews gather, the rapid flow of supplies, and the kit from dock to dock. You can tell already that news of the flotilla's eminent departure has reached this place before you. Come to join the Exodus Sleeper. Peter approaches you from one of the working crews, a smile on his face, and a lightness in his step you haven't seen before. Not quite. I suppose you are here on Soul's orders again? Nothing Ember's Hearth liked to do more than ordering people around. I'm here by choice. Fair enough. Just your timing seems to always be a cycle or two after we get some request from the Hearth's ship. Must be a coincidence. Well, Soul has it at lucky anyway. His request for us to dismantle the Axis and be the vanguard of the flotilla's onward journey to the Starwood Belt aligns perfectly with our plans. What plans? To leave this damn place, of course. We've been prepping ever since the cordon collapsed. If we can build our escape and make the hardships think we are complying with their orders and at the same time, then it's a two-in-one for us. Those idiots will never see it coming. We can't abandon them. We are our own flotilla sleeper. We aren't going to tie ourselves to heart and step any longer. Why would we? To help them. They are taking on evacuees from the eyes. That's what I heard. So how about they help themselves before they ask us to make up for their bad decisions? Look, nothing against you or yours, Sleeper. But we have to get out from under the shadow of Step and Hearth. And this is the time. We won't let the Flux catch us again. Not a chance. Want to help us make that leap? Grab a torch, talk to your crew, you're welcome to it. Every person is here is, is free to prove themselves. I'll help where I can. Just a stop on the road, sleeper. I'm afraid that's all this was. A lot of space out there for those willing to take it. I hope you'll be around before we go, but if not, stay strong. Oof. So they're going to... Jeez. Wild. We don't have a ton of time for solving all these problems, team. So we do the other tasks first, and then we fix the eye.
Ooh. Not the worst numbers. We start by helping Aki, because I like Aki. She's cool. Um, greening the step. Greening the step. Greening the step. Reroll. Damn. Greening the step. Wow, we got a lucky outcome. Good. All right, we're almost done with that one. We need to go get food. Oh, we have mushrooms to collect. I don't think we're doing that. I think time is not on our side. have an active scene to do. We gotta go see Lem. <sighs> There's no answer when you buzz Lem's unit, but the door is open. You push the door and find Mina sitting in the middle of the floor playing with Bun Bun. Hi Mina. Hi robot. Mina says sullenly waving Bun Bun's paw without looking up. How are you? Bun Bun is sad. Like daddy. You look around the unit. It is a mess. Dishes and glasses on the side. Some of Mina's clothes piled up in the corner. Mina is sitting by her bag, which spilled out across the floor. Her drawing slate cracked and dark. Tidy up. You start with the kitchen units, piling up dishes in the auto wash and wiping them down. You pile the clothes up next, folding them neatly. Mina watches you quietly as she plays, curious but silent. You've just started to look at fixing her cracked slate when Lev enters. Sleeper, what are you? Never mind. Everything okay? You forgot the past five cycles now, too? Wish I was so lucky. Look, now is not a good time. I want to help. Help? Unless you have a sidereal ticket or two on you, I don't think there's much you can do here. You understand they never even put us on the list, right? I've been all around the rim looking for work, and I've run into more than a few from the crews. It turns out only longtime Havenage members were issued those sell us ID numbers. They never planned to consider us. Havenage say they didn't know that was what they were going to use to make the draw, and who knows, maybe Celis pulled the wool over their eyes, but what does it matter? All those hours in the yards for a hand-to-mouth wage and nothing else. You give it up. Opens his mouth to respond, but stops himself. He looks at the open door again. They're moving the sidereal up to the hub now, you know. That's where it'll depart from. They're bringing in a ship with all their cryosleep pioneers and transferring them up there in microgravity before loading the crew. We could sneak aboard. You think you're just going to let people on board? The security they'll have has to be impossible. Look, we'll be fine. We always have been. I just need a little time. We had our hearts set on that trip is all. Mina comes over and climbs to his lap. He smiles. What if I got you on board? I missed you these past few cycles. I missed that optimism. Look, you want to go up to the hub and ask around be my guest? I can't get up there with Mina down here, and I'm sure the Sidereal will bring in a crowd. But be careful. This kind of thing always attracts scammers and thieves. You find any way on board, you take it. You need help to get there? Ask me. But for now, me and Mina are sticking to the eye. Thanks, Slim. Oh, thank you, Sleeper, for coming by. You stand to leave, and Mina grabs your hand, eager to give you one more smile. Then you are out, back in the hall, walkways of the low end, already thinking of plans to make this right. Hey, look what's gone. Yeah, Armageddon at our door. Plenty of time. Everything's fine. Hey, it's the Sidereal at dock. So we can scout the dock for a way on board. But I mean also, like, hey. Oh wait, I should actually look at that again. Is there a clock on it? There's no clock. Okay. So we have time. The 
Sabote? Sabotage, perhaps? I imagine was what that was meant to say. Um. We are going to since that's not ticking down on us on a time limit yet, we're going to take care of these other things first. Um, interface. You sit in one corner of the dust houses and inspect your work. This dust house, the one where the plants from the greenway and some of the steppe species intermingle, has become your favorite. The moss and dust sharing the space in curving terraces. The pale knots of steppe silk freckled with yellowing lycal symbionts. It is a hypnotic arrangement. You look down and see the intertwining of fungal threads and dust-caked roots and feel a little glow of pride at what has been achieved. You hear the entry lock of the dust house hiss open, and assuming it is Aki, you turn to greet her. Rico! <laughs> Sleeper, I should have known you'd be here. You must be one of those green-fingered people on the one of the most green-fingered people on the station. Rico! Now, now, has it been so long? No need for any drama. I get some of the step refugees in the green. I met some of the step refugees in the greenway. They were gathering plants, and I confronted them. Turns out they were very friendly. Aki was very apologetic, but I told them they were welcome to anything they liked. She told me I'd be welcome to come see, and well, I thought I'd pick her up on the offer. I have to say, I'm glad I did. I'm glad too. I can see that. <laughs> How about you take me on a tour? You take Rico's hand and walk her around the hybrid dust house. You show her how the step silk knots help provide a strong base for the fungal and lichen growths, and how the dust mixes with the spores. You show her the different species of step tubers and the way they feed the soil with nutrients that help herba herbaceous greenway plants thrive. She nods her long, her eyes bright with ideas. She stops after a while and gestures for you to sit together. I know something is happening with the eye sleeper. We have all felt the flux event hit, and everyone is talking about what's next. I came out here to figure something out, to understand what I might be able to do about it all. And I think I have decided. What you have done here, what Aki and the other stuff have done here is incredible. A whole new ecosystem built from strange, artificial change remains of two worlds. But I am not of two worlds. I am of the eye. A tear runs down a tree. Like it or not, I am entwined with the station. I'm old growth. I don't have that much time anymore, and it seems to accelerate with every cycle. It blurs together, separates, overlaps, comes back to me in strange ways. The time I do have, that's time I want to spend on the eye, in the greenway, watching things grow. One day I'll lie in those fields and not get back up. And when the green takes me, I'll be so glad. You could leave. You know, Sleeper, when you get to my age, you stop thinking about what you could do and try to better understand why it is you act as you do. I know I will stay. I just need to understand it. But that's enough of me blubbering on about it. What I want to know is what you're planning. I'm staying. We all have to get to know ourselves, sleepers, you know, what it is that drives us. I'm sure you'll decide to act in the manner you know. But also, you also have to ask yourself why it is so. Don't neglect that. Oh, don't let me forget this. She reaches into her coat and pulls out a transparent bag of sporing club heads. With carefully preserved root systems, I'd like to plant these. If you go, you'll need them. And if you don't, well, maybe another sleeper will benefit. I can offer that, at least. Thank you. Don't thank me. These are yours by right. Rico stands and limps over to a pile of mulch. She delicately takes the club heads out and beds them into the soil there with precise, expert hands. You should go, sleeper. I'll be a while. See you around. Is there, but there's a note of finality in her speech. See you around. You turn and leave the dust house, cycling through the protective lock and back into the cool quiet of the ship. Aki is waiting for you. It is beautiful. She is looking through the observation window and the green reflects in her eyes. The plants look happy together. Ah, the botanist came. A friend of yours? More than that. She speaks beautifully about the greenway. I should go in and welcome her. Are you leaving us? Yes. The first of many goodbyes. She suddenly embraces you, wrapping you in her layers of rough cloth. She pulls back. I wish you a steady step and a clear path. A farewell from my world. I wish you the same. She nods and smiles one last warm smile. 
before turning and entering the dust house. He watches she walks inside. Rico turns with a smile to greet her. She kneels beside the old botanist, and you see her pointing to the club heads, asking questions. You are unable to hear them, but despite that, you can easily imagine the measured, even tone laced with excitement that Rico is using to explain the club heads, the greenway, and much, much more. You turn, leaving them to their conversation. Your step is light, despite the burdens you carry and the smile Rico and Aki were sharing is somehow still on your lips as you depart. You excellent when you strip wires and components from the axis walls to dismantle them and cruise on the crest. Here we go. It's gonna be the same thing, so we're just gonna slam this through here. docking axis is little more than a shell. Everything that could have been pulled from its interior, every arm not used for docking, has been cut away. What remains is a spartan void with a patchwork of flooring that allows movement. Piles of unusable material are tucked away in corners, but almost everything else has been cleared out. You haven't seen Peter since you last spoke, and now you are realizing that you probably never will. There are plans to be made, escapes to plot, the shadow of hearth to escape. On the cycle of the flotilla leaves, these ships will disperse too, the moons of Ember spinning out on different orbits. The chaos has become a quiet diligence now. As the time for departure is so near, crews cross the axis from ship to ship at speed, bringing supplies or advice, perhaps meeting up to discuss travel vectors in hushed tones or to debate why they haven't left yet and whether they should. Among these singer crews, recognizable for their specialist clothing and often shorn heads, you see the occasional refugee, a paying passenger or a replacement engineer or pilot perhaps, come from the eye to seek fortune with the singers. Most of the crews have two or three of these additions, some more, and you can't help but wish that whatever reason brings them to throw their line with the singer crews, they have a safe passage. You feel a strange attachment to these citizens of the eye setting out for the first time. And then one of them catches your eye, crossing the axis of the crew, carrying a large bag and a nervous look. Tala! You freeze for a second. What is she doing here? She glances around, feeling your eyes on her, and catches your eye. Her face brightens immediately. Sleeper! Tala mutters to her crew and rushes over, dumping the large bag at your feet and bracing you without thinking. Are you leaving? Sleeper. I'm... I'm going to the Starward Belt. Why didn't you say? Do you remember me mentioning my family sleeper? My brother? You think back to your griol blurred, griol blurred conversations in the back of the Bantayan. He came here with me, with my family, when we were little. Just after we left Sinza. He left when we were both teenagers, jumped on some spacer crew heading for, to the Starward Belt. I'm an idiot, and I'm going after him. Alone? I guess so. I really don't know if it makes any sense, 
or if it's the right thing, but ever since I heard that was where the refugee flotilla was going, well, I couldn't stop thinking about it. What happens to the bar? Someone will have to run it. She leaves a long pause. I mean, I can ask Francis. He'd be happy to, or one of the others, she points out. Oh, and of course, if you're leaving with the flotilla or someone else, it'd be totally okay, and you wouldn't need to say yes. It's no pressure. It's fine. Whichever way, I was just thinking... I could run the bar. I think so. I mean, you can take a second, but... Er, there's not exactly much time. So, considering that, she grabs the key hanging around her neck. The key to the Bantian. Do you want it? Yes. Thank you, sleeper. I couldn't be leaving it in better hands. She pulls the key from around her neck and places it in you, around yours as if presenting a medal. Remember to lock up, especially the back. And remember to empty the still if you were leaving things closed for a few cycles. And she stops herself. I won't be gone forever, of course. I can come back and check in. Maybe once I find my brother. She's unable to finish the thought. She's ready. I better be going. Not a good start to keep my guys waiting. She lifts the bag onto her shoulder. She looks down the curve of the eye towards the overlook. Thanks again, sleeper, for everything you helped me with. I wouldn't have been able to leave if I hadn't made things work here. Dad wouldn't have let me. See you around. Hope so. Then Tala turns, heading back to the crew who will carry her to the starward belt. You watch her go, despite the departure. But it's hard to feel sad about Tala. You know her energy will carry her forward, and you hope her brother is somewhere on that bright path. You hold the key in your hand, the metal still a little warm from Tala's body. You turn it over in your fingers, thinking about how it feels like a tool and a burden. You can still walk up and leave, you figure, but now that will feel like breaking something fragile, and if you stay, well, who knows what this little metal promise might grow into. Alright, so I could finish Pilgrim Prep right now, but I don't want to yet. And we've still got six days before that kicks off. Hey, I own a bar. Wild. I can't do anything with the gardener. I have to wait for Peak to contact me, he said. I thought. also get the flotilla out. But I also have to help Lem. And I'm curious how something's going to go. Good re-roll. Quite the achievement, isn't she? Sender Celis must be proud. You recognize the resonating voice of Castor immediately and turn to see him. <sighs> Hooded and tucked into the shadows near the viewing platform. Ignore him. Sleeper, I'm a friend. I came all the way up here to see you. I hear there was some trouble at the Haven and Shipyard when they announced the results of the crew lottery. I was there. I know. An ugly business. Sell us are too used to the way things work in the core. Exploitation is the only logic they know. You know where they built this monstrosity on the eye? Money. That was part, perhaps, but there, were ch but there are cheaper shipyards. 
Silas built it here because they didn't want anyone to know it exists. And secrecy is something I cannot abide. Says the man who keeps secrets. Yeah, friends don't <laughs> friends don't uh, prevent friends from having bodily autonomy. There are people being loaded onto that ship as we speak. Sleeping people locked in cryosleep like the person you were emulated from. There are hundreds of them, and Celis wants to send them out to a planet at the edge of the settled systems without anyone knowing where it is. But you, sleeper, can do something about that. You are like me. You deal with data. You can read it right out of the air. With someone like you on that ship, secrecy isn't a problem. You can ping back whatever I need whenever I need it, as long as you are on board. With you and the Sidereal, and with some minor modifications, you can be my eyes and ears. I will keep track of Celis' grand project through you. In short, I can get you on board, sleeper, but I'm going to need you to help me. What if I disagree? Then I doubt you will find another way into the ship out there. It's not just me. Ah, your friend, Lem. That can be arranged. It is difficult, but not impossible. The condition is, of course, that you go, too. Caster clunks closer to the window, watching the tugs wheeling around the scenario. It's a simple offer, and the only one that will get you on that ship. Please consider it. He turns back, silhouetted against the ship. But to make it happen, I need your assistance. As I said, there's a Celis Foundation ship docked in the now empty shipyard. I need the data from its servers. This will allow me to produce IDs necessary for your transit. Celis aren't stupid, though. Their ship is totally isolated from the station. You need to get on board if you want to access their airwalled servers. Once you have the data, meet me at your friend's unit so we can give him the good news. I notice his importance to you. And the little one. So cute. You don't extract the data before the steel horizon leaves the hub, then I will get the message. We have other options, but you are certainly my preferred one. But we have to be sure when you act, sleeper. Once you take the data from Celis, you'll set off a series of events that will likely be hard for you to untangle yourself from. Either way, I recommend you stop asking around up here. You are bring a lot of attention to yourself. There are only a handful of cycles until departure, sleeper. Make your decision. With that, Carster marches back off the platform, the sound of his mag boots fading away, leaving you to contemplate the sidereal horizon and the part it may play in your future. Okay. <clears throat> so now that we've seen that, that was actually the last storyline I did um, this one with the sidereal. It was the last one I did on my previous playthrough. And I had not had the previous interaction with Caster. So, the I find it interesting how the order of those interactions can color who he is as a person. Very cool. Alright, so the Sidereal departs in eight days. I don't want Lem to go on that ship, though. That ship sucks. Alright, so we need to do this to get that data so that we can get tickets for Lemon Mina. Well, I don't want it to crash if Lemon and Mina are on board. Come on. Just help Lem find a good job? Hmm. Right there with you, honestly. End cycle. I do own a bar. I do need bartenders. Like, what I want is the option to send Lem to Seoul. 
because Lem is an engineer. He can build things. He will be useful to these people, right? What I want is a thing that they did not build into their game. They just keep coming. Perhaps the flux event scared enough people that they really believe the eye will collapse. Perhaps they are sick of Havenage, the council's infighting and the hardliners. Or perhaps they want to take a chance at some new future, a place that is anywhere but here. Whatever it is, the evacuees don't stop. They come on the flotilla's shuttles, on their own ships, however they can. You've seen so many faces pass, they are almost meaningless now. A parade of features that seem both familiar and distant. You've been helping people, lifting bags, bringing in supplies, directing them to the berths you help build. Some of them recoil from your touch, still unfamiliar with sleepers. Others treat you with pity, some with hate, snatching back their bags and storming off. Still you help. You carry boxes and bags. Nothing can stop you. You don't look for soul. You know he is busy, just like you, trying to make this thing work, trying to fit as many people as will come into the pilgrim seed. You know you will see him before all this is over. You keep working, but there's something in the back of your mind, something eating away at you. You try to push it to the back of your thoughts, and it keeps coming back. The eye is over. That is the thought. That the eye, even if the flux doesn't get it, is on its way out. How can it survive when these floods of people are leaving it behind? It's a thought that troubles you, because it makes you question why you have held on here so long, in a place that seems so temporary for so many people. Are you just a stubborn idiot? Someone who didn't get the message? Or are you strong, committed for lasting the storm, for seeing the collapse coming and facing it head on? Because there is something you are sure of now. This place, like all places, is temporary. And as each fe face passes you, each family packs up and gets on board the pilgrim seat. It feels ever more temporary, ever more fragile. Which means it is either desperately needs protecting or desperately needs to be left behind. The choice is yours. Ah, we have three upgrade points. Um, we're going to upgrade our engage. Where the hell are you, Peak? Yes, I choose protect. Me, perfect being. <laughs> I protect you. Uh, engage. Three rolls. Oh, I'm only allowed to do that once? Lame. Really? Come on, give me my thing. Emphasis, buddy. I could really go for some food. <laughs> End of the cycle. People suck.
Well, I guess there's nothing to do but do it. We'll arrive at Lemon Mina's unit. Caster is already waiting outside, leaning beside the door. Forgive me, Sleeper, but Celis is already buzzing with news of the breach. I was expecting you. I don't like you tracking me. That is unfortunate, Sleeper, because that is exactly what I will be doing for the foreseeable future. Caster reaches into a pocket and produces a sleek green and white hand terminal. The data, please. What is that? Something I acquired from Celis while you were busy on that ship. I haven't been waiting for you the entire time. You hand over a drive with the data, and Caster fishes around for a converter cable to hook it up. He slots it into the terminal, and after some worrying, a set of two transparent films marked with numeric sequences are produced. Two tickets to an uncertain future. The child will go with Lem, of course. These are yours, but first, your side of the deal. What is it? Something to help us make use of you. He passes you the square, and you rest it on your palm. A small, white, perfect cube. Suddenly you feel a sharp pain and a flinch. The cube jumps away from your hand and rattles along the walkway. You look at Caster apologetically. Not to worry, it has done its job. Now it is for you to do yours. You look down and see a tiny pinprick in the center of your palm. Nothing sinister. Caster puts the terminal away. This way we can keep track of you on the sidereal horizon. I didn't agree to this. You did, sleeper. You have to understand that I could have done this without you knowing. This way, everything is on the table, so to speak. Caster hands you the transparent films, and you see the shimmering portraits of you and Lem flickering beneath the surface. Go, give them the good news. He reaches across and buzzes the unit. Lem slides open the door, half dressed in his gear. Sleeper, what brings you up here? Come in. And you look to the side, expecting to see Caster, but the wall is empty. The unit is cleaner, better organized than last time. Lem sits at the thin bar and gestures for you to sit. Mina's with some of the local kids. Someone has started doing lessons down the way. She seems to like it. Sit. You sit at the bar. What's up, sleeper? I have some news. Out with it, then. God! Let's also not forget that them getting these tickets is just guaranteeing that they're going to be indentured for the next decade or two. To working on this ship. You look around the unit. You look at Lem. He looks better, softer, more full of life. It's as if a weight has been lifted off from his shoulders. You think of Mina a few units down learning from other children who falter. Is the sidereal horizon better than this? No! You in trouble? Dead? Nothing. Forget it. You sure are acting funny. You sure nothing's up? I'm good. Just tired. I hear you. Been taking shifts moving freight at the midline. Hard work, but makes use of my Conway drone training. What is holding you back? It's now or never. Will you leave together, or are you better off on the eye? You make a decision. Lem and Mina are better off here. You are better off here. Caster can go hang. Lem notices you aren't listening and stops. Fancy staying until Mina gets home? She'd be thrilled to see you. Sure. It's not long until the sidereal leaves, you know. I was thinking of taking Mina to see it off when it does. What do you think? Why? Maybe because I'm stubborn. Or maybe there's a lesson in there for little Mina. Not sure. Holding on. That's all we can do, right? Just hold on a little. That'll be her. And Mina, a bundle of energy and life, rushes into the room. Robot! I learned how to draw a tree today. Show me. Mina grabs her slate, now half obscured by shiny black tape, and brings it over. Never even saw a tree, says Mina. But Esther showed me. She starts with a line. Then she draws a V, splitting it in two directions. And she splits those lines again. She keeps doing this. She keeps splitting and splitting the lines. Until, before long, the whole slate is filled with branches. She sets it down proudly and hands you a pen. Your turn. And a while later, when you leave, you don't even think to check for Caster by the door until it's too late. You stop and turn, halfway down the walkway, but there's nothing there. Even that little white cube is gone. 
we stop and take out the two films, the faces, yours and Lem's, staring out from the muted, like, figures encased in ice. How did Castor even get these images? A rush of anger runs through you, and you crumble them in your hand. You let the films drop. They bounce once, twice, then fall through the grill of the walkway into darkness. The future leaving as easily as it arrived. You pause for a moment. There doesn't seem to be anything else to be done, so you keep walking back through the low end, deep in thought. Yeah, like, it's a great question, like, why? Why would you do this? Like, it's a way out, surely, right? But, like, let's not forget, I don't survive long without a source of stabilizer. And you want to know who hooked me up with a way to make stabilizer? Gardener. Rico. These are my people. But there's nothing for me to do. As near as I can tell, there's nothing else for me to do. I have nothing else to spend time on. So I guess we just harvest stuff and continue living. I can't free the gardener. I don't have an option to free the gardener. I have looked in every location. I did finish the pilgrims. There's nothing more for me to do. I can't do anything else out here. The only thing out here is the clock. Like, I can't connect the greenway. Flotilla's all done. Let's just remember the flux is going to hit before the sidereal leaves, so it's going to have problems. There was previously a step I did not want to do yet. But I really am just kind of running down the clocks now. Aha! Peak slate chirps in your pocket. You take it out. 
The connection is ready. Meet me at the Founders Gap, Greenway side, Peak. Clench your jaw. It's time. Hey, Peak. You find Peak waiting near where you first met, at the entrance to the docking tunnel for the Founders Ferry. You are leaning, they are leaning beside the wall in the flickering light. You realize now how different they look from when you first met. There is a darkness around their eyes, a sense of exhaustion to their pose, but also a solidity, a sense of purpose and self-knowledge. They look concrete, for want of a better word. Solid. Sleeper, glad you came. I wouldn't be anywhere else. Crunch time. Let's go. The break in the connection is up ahead. They walk away, the docking tunnel, into a ragged, half-crushed corridor that descends into darkness. They poke their slate and the torch flicks on, lighting the way ahead. As you descend through the layers of the broken edge of the eye, Peak talks, filling the silence. I had to hunt all over this part of the eye to find the point where the connection was broken. This hole, the gap, got knocked in the eye when Solheim collapsed. It's impossible to tell who did it, but my guess is they tried to scuttle the eye. Solheim couldn't keep a hold of their fancy new station. Well, no one could. So this place has always been on borrowed time. I've managed to weave together the old connections and run a new patch down to where the main line still runs through the remaining ribs of the rim. Just like keeping those old XBR platforms running. I should be proud if she bothered to help. As Pete goes quiet, the corridor opens up into a wider, twisted passage with compartments on either side with thick wiring. Here's the connection point. You can see where Peak has leveled, levered off a panel and hold, hooked a thick cable up to the existing hardware. As thick as a tree trunk, it snakes off into the dark ahead, its yellow rings making it look like some huge exotic serpent. You did all this? It was an interesting challenge. Plus, it helped me keep my mind off things. There's a lot of things I'd prefer not to think about. You stand there, staring at the point where the new cable meets the old one, the ends separate. Fitted with multi-pin male and female connectors and braced inside a metal framework with a scissoring mechanism. Bringing them together, seal them, and the green one will be connected to the rest of the eye for the first time in decades. Peak shifts their weight onto one hip, pushing their hair out of their eyes. I feel like this should be more momentous, like they, there should be a ritual or ceremony, or someone should stop us from doing this crazy thing. It isn't crazy. I mean, I'm not being funny, Sleeper, but this whole, this whole thing is crazy to me. Leaving Hawthorne with Ash, joining the Fertilla, coming here, meeting you, the Flux, the Shadow, everything. So I suppose this is at least consistent with all that. Okay. <clears throat> they hold both sides of the supporting framework. Ready? This isn't closed. Here we go. Peak wrenches the framework closed, and the connectors thunk together with a sound that echoes down the ruined corridor into the dark on both sides. Both you and Peak wait with bated breath, unsure what it is you are waiting for. Do you expect the eye to suddenly stop spinning or lurch on its axis for the power to go out or a shockwave to run through the corridors of the rim? You meet Peak's eyes. And suddenly they both start laughing. What are we waiting for? They put a hand on their forehead. I feel like we just planted a tree and are expecting you to burst out of the ground. But you feel it. You feel it flowing like a stream that has been released from a cave and rushes out into the sunlight, crystalline and clear. You swear you can hear it running in the wires, like water, like rain, like steam. It doesn't roar or rattle. It rustles and rides. There, like liquid roots. Peek sees the look in your eyes and stops laughing. You can see it, can't you? You can't see it. Not with your eyes, at least. But it is everywhere, and now it is out can't be put back in that much is clear you imagine the rim of the eye is like a sponge like soil soaking up the gardener in their chorus the gaps filling with a burbling constant growing life peak stares at you waiting for something anything gardener is free they go to speak but the words fail them suddenly peak slate trips they jump and scramble for it almost dropping it in the process they stare at it and fusion crosses their face what happened it's esh she's leaving they look at you with panic. Before you can speak, they have turned away and are moving back up the passageway, back to the entrance. Peek! They don't turn around, don't respond, and you watch their silhouette lit by their slate's torch disappearing rapidly around a corner. You take out the sleep Peek gave you and turn on the torch. The wire is all around, looking like pale roots in the harsh light, and turn away from them. They are the gardeners now. You work your way back through the corridors, retracing your steps. You imagine Peak, panicked, running towards the cordon, realizing that their greatest fear has come to pass. You wonder if they will be able to persuade Esh to stay. If Esh is going, you think, then the flotilla must be leaving too. The thought makes you shiver in the darkness, and you push it away. You are not ready. 
You focus on avoiding the hanging wires, the low ceilings, and make your way back out into the lit corridors of Founder's Ferry Dock. Caster is waiting for you. He holds up his hands. Now, now, sleeper, no need to fear. I understand now. It was my mistake to try to force you. A miscalculation. Why are you here? Good, good. Questions are good. I am more than happy to answer any you may have. I won't hold you here, sleeper, but I wish to speak. You've lost that right. <laughs> but fine. You stop giving Caster his opportunity. At first I thought that, if you'll excuse the turn of phrase, taking possession of your particular talents was the opportunity. But you are more than that, and I understand that now. Your arrival on the station, your ability to touch the networks, this makes you the very definition of a wild card. Senate sits analysis, my analysis, we could never have accounted for you. This system, the Helian system, is about to experience a significant change, about to open up to Senate stats bailiffs. Conway's claimants and every industry and element an active can channel brings. Yet this very cycle, you let another wild card free. Gardner. I have to admit, this development makes me afraid, Sleeper. It makes me afraid what an intelligence like this will sacrifice to protect itself, or what atrocities it might commit through madness. And yet, what a compelling object such an intelligence is. Hey, Caster, I want to slap you so hard you fly through the bulkhead into space. Is that cool? Let me protect you, mark you out, keep Senate stat from eliminating by force or legal expediency you as they will with every other squatter on this ring. And in exchange, when Senate stat comes for this place, you facilitate the handover, you calm the protocols, you give us the gardener. Never. Caster takes the, off their glasses and polishes them. Disappointing. You begin to leave. As you approach, he speaks quietly in urgent whisper. I do not wish to see you lost. You are of great value. If you ever want to see that realized, you push past, ignoring him. And his voice fades. The last you see of him is his slow nod, perhaps a mark of resignation, or just another deferential gesture aimed at manipulating your response. It doesn't matter either way. You are done with him. You head towards the cordon, peek in the flotilla in the forefront of your mind. Yeah, Caster, maybe if you had... I don't know, talked to me. But instead what you want to do is destroy the lives of thousands of people because you're a dick. Literally commit mass murder and tell yourself that it's not your fault because you were just the broker. Right? Well, the gardener is an intelligence he doesn't understand. He knows the corporation he works for. He knows it intimately. Peek! You arrive into chaos at the cordon. The final shuttles are leaving the ramshackle docks that have formed along the edge of the gap during the flotilla's stay. As they do, groups of evacuees push on board, hoping to be among the final people to escape from the eye. The fear created by the flux event became a series of rumors, and those rumors have driven many out of their homes. Others have staunchly doubled down on their position on the eye and refused to accept any gossip of a second collapse. You are unsure what you think. Is the collapse a certainty? Will Peak's actions the cycle have changed anything at all? You are tired of these questions, and instead you set out to look for your friends. You quickly spot Peak and Ash at the far side of the chaotic bay. You quickly make your way through the crowd, slipping between the gaps and the rushing evacuees, stepping over bags and luggage. Progress is slow, but as you approach, you can hear their voices over the crowd. You try to push closer, but there are many evacuees gathered around them in their shuttle. You have made your decision, Peek, and it puts you against me. Ash is standing with one foot on the boarding ramp while Peek argues with her. The evacuees are eyeing them, eager to intervene, but intimidated by Ash's evident strength and attitude. Ash, it doesn't have to be like this. We can find a way. Oh, he's crying. They're crying. S shakes her head. I have always protected you, Peek. I have taken you under my wing. But I understand that you are not mine to control, and you have chosen. Chosen to be here and not with me, despite everything. I have chosen to stop running. You can choose to stop running, too. We can stay here and try to live. Don't you remember what it feels like to live, Esh? I remember what it was like to live on Hawthorne. What it was like to be worried for your safety every cycle. To live under the control of my mother or of the administration. To work to maintain something that no one wanted, no one needed, so that our corporation could maintain a foothold in this system. 
You talk as if this place, if the very same system is any different. What is there here f but the same grind for other masters, for employers, administrators, for those who gain from our struggles? There may not be a corporation controlling the eye, but there is control. There is power in action here. So what then? You run from anyone or everyone who could ever be close to you in search of freedom? In search of some perfect place where no one has power over you? I want to be part of something, Ash, even if it is broken and suffering, even if it cannot be free. This isn't Hawthorne anymore. We aren't tied by our childhood or by our shared need to escape. We are both just people in this system. I release you, Peek. You are free of me. Ash, please, there is a life here if you want it. Then you live it for me, Peek. I can't. She climbs up the boarding ramp. The evacuees taking their chance to climb on board, too. You watch as the shuttle closes its ramp, lifts off, and leaves the bay. The crowds are dispersing now as they get onto shuttles or say goodbyes and move back into the main part of the cordon. You push past the last of them and reach Peak. Peak doesn't turn as you come closer. Sleeper Ash is gone. She chose to leave. I've known her my whole life, but since we arrived... We've been going different directions. I'll miss the briar, but she'll serve Esh well, I know that. Sleeper! <laughs> the shout takes you by surprise, and as you turn, you see Soul coming across the bay towards you, the last two shuttles loading up behind him. Can't believe you'd make an old man run across this bay to get you. The singers have gone. They left at the start of the cycle. They broke away from the flotilla. You smile as you think of Tala, safely cradled within one of those singer ships on her way to the Starward Belt, hopefully reunion with her brother. Godspeed, Tala. What are you smiling at? They forced our hand. We have to leave now. If we follow close enough behind, maybe they'll end up being our scouts anyway. I reckon any hostile spaces out there will give them a wide berth. Pilgrim Seed will need a little time to make our way out of the cordon. But I'm heading back now to get her started. Thankfully, the step ships are sticking with us, so we'll be plenty well supplied for the journey to the belt. Anyway, I didn't plot all the way over here to tell you all that. It's now or never, Sleeper. I'm good to my word, and I kept a berth for you, but this is your last chance to take it. He scratches in his beard. Make a call. You glance out at the flotilla beyond the bay, beautiful in the light of Helian's sun. You think of the long journey to the Starward Belt, of the people inside the Pilgrim Seed and the possible futures that await. Then you think of the people here, on the eye. Of Peak beside you, of Ben Tian, of Tala, and the key that still hangs around your neck, of promises and possibilities. We stay. You open your mouth to speak and realize this is the final time you will make this choice. You have to be sure. I'm staying. You say the words, and the moment you do, the weight of it seems to descend on you. You stumble a little and stand straight, refusing to be crushed. You feel a tightness in your chest, and a haze blurring your thoughts. Good luck. You'll need it. He grips your shoulder and meets your eye. In the haze, he, his pitted and rough hands feel so real, so detailed, that it grounds you. And then it is gone, and Sol goes with it, quickly moving up to the waiting shuttle. As he does, you watch, and able to speak, your whole body pulsing. And then another hand falls on your shoulder, and it grounds you once more. You turn to see Peek's bright eyes. Let's go, sleeper. You nod, and seeing how unsteady you are on your feet, Peek puts an arm around you and steers you towards the entrance to the bay. And as they do, you hear the roar, feel the wind as the shuttle lifts off and angles towards the flotilla. You don't turn. Instead, you keep your head down and focus on each step. As you do, you feel peak beside you, holding a little of your weight, and you're holding a little of theirs. And this is how it will be for many cycles after you both leave the bay and head back into the eye. You will both hold things for each other, remind each other of the choices you made, remind each other of why it is important to keep going, despite the moments when it seems impossible you will keep each other going. That support will be vital when the second flux event hits the eye, when it knocks the entire free spoke off the power grid, making the whole station lurk with a sickening motion, when it cripples systems and corrupts processes, leading sections of the station to go dark or start venting oxygen, when holding on is all you can do while the world seems to come apart around you. And yet somehow, the eye will persist. Systems will resist total collapse in ways that will seem inexplicable to many, but to you and Peak, they will signal the awakening of a new force within the station. 
That new force will bring with it new challenges and new possibilities in equal measure. Strange growths will be reported all around the station in the wake of the flux event. Fungal crusts pushing through pipes and wiring. The eye will go wild and fecund, becoming a station of increasing unpredictability, prone to a seasonal rhythm of spore clouds and sudden growth spurts. There will be a strange and unsettling beauty to this paradigm shift as the greening of the station turns it from a corporate ruin to some altogether new assemblage of biological and mechanical structures. Rico will take on this challenge with energy that seems impossible for her age, and until her final day she will delight in the new mysteries the eye and its gardener produce. And as this new era consolidates around the station, you will find yourself in the Bantian most cycles, working to keep the place alive. The cycle where you invite Emphis to come make use of the kitchen will go from a one-off event to a regular occurrence, and soon the Bantian will be filled with spacers eager to try the best preparations of the station's now abundant mushrooms. And on occasion, after a long shift at the Bantian, you will hear the sound of the stray mewling, and you will crumble up some food and sit and watch the cat eat as if it is the only thing in your world that matters. However, into all this newness, the bad old ways will still intrude. Senate Stat, frustrated by the eye's resilience, will begin to send more physical threats and supply ships and traders will suddenly stop arriving, stopped by a blockade of corporate militia. Life on the eye will be punctuated by wide channel broadcasts from Senate stats stating legal precedents and quoting deeds of ownership, staking a claim on the system. Meanwhile, Havenage's hardliners will fizzle out, losing their grip on the Havenage Council. In their wake, Helena will spearhead a series of reforms that will scale back Havenage's overreach, returning them to the caretaker role they had always intended to fulfill. As the cycles roll on and the threats gather, new broadcasts will join them sent by Conway Extractions, making counterclaims on assets within the Helian system, and many on the eye will grow quiet, losing their appetite for debating these political machinations as they tilt inexorably towards corporate war. And ever on, the eye will spin. Growing now in strange ways, haunted by strange new growths, and hosting cultures of increasing resilience. As the Helian system descends into crisis, you will find comfort in the fungal patterns, the familiar conversations, the spices and the smells that will accumulate around you as your body continues its unavoidable decay. They settle around you like a veil, and in time it will be impossible to see the eye without seeing its many variants and versions, pasts and potential futures, and this masking of the world will mark your approaching end. And one cycle, far from now, that accumulation of memories, of tastes, of people and places and moments will be the last thing you let go of. But for now, there is only you and Peak, arms around each other, walking slowly out of the bay, two figures born of crippled systems linked together, continuing despite your origins. And in this frozen moment, you focus on only the next step, because that is the only way you have learnt to persist. And to persist is to believe that a future, any future at all, is possible. I'm not crying, you're crying. people wrote an amazing game it's so good like I am so tempted to play it again and again and again even though like I've seen almost all of the stories right like it's like I could have decided to take caster's deal right get on the sidereal with Lem and Mina 
and go, right? I could have fled earlier. I had the opportunity with Ankita and uh, Bliss, you know? It's like I had so many chances to leave. Um, but I wanted to know more, you know? I wanted to, like, take all of the pieces of this story. Um, and it's so freaking good. And as you can see, right, Citizen Sleeper 2 has been announced. Um, where you are a new sleeper on the run in the Starward Belt. So it's a different thing, but same setting, which is cool. I am very excited. Uh, but yeah, like there's just, oh God, how do you, like I said, so like I, in my previous playthrough, I had done the entire thing. I sent Lemon Mina on that ship the first time I played. Um, and that was the first time I saw the credits in the game as I finished his storyline, Mina's storyline. And I stayed behind. I had no way to survive, right? Like, I hadn't done the stuff with Gardner yet, right? Like, I did not have my own source of stabilizer. Um, you know, I saw no way forward going on that ship. And so I sent them away. And the thing is that was great is, like, when it came back from the credits, Caster was there. And again, like I hadn't had the negative encounter with Caster that you have in the Flux story yet. So he was like, well, things happen. We'll just do something else. It's okay, right? You get to live your own life. It's fine. Which is why I was shocked that they did that turn with Caster on the Flux storyline where he takes away your autonomy. Uh, like that's wild. Um, and so, yeah, you know, like it completely changes the color of your interactions with him. Right. It's like, I fed him a bunch of information on Yadigan and Havenage for supplies that I needed. Right. Like I needed that stuff so I could survive at the time. And now I look back on it and I'm like, geez, that was a mistake. I shouldn't have given that guy anything. He's bad news. He's more of a villain than the bounty hunter who was going to shoot me in the head. It's a good time. I really enjoyed that. A lot. Like, so much. It's so good. And the, the pull away at the end to show the entirety of the eye so you can see it all in its completeness. Good job, game designer. Well done. Whoever put that one in and like made that happen, solid. The writing is so good. The pacing is good. Well, so where does that leave us? It's Thursday. Tomorrow's Friday. No stream on Friday. Back Saturday. I can stream through the weekend. I cannot stream next week, basically. It will not be here um, for that. The game was so good. Like, let's, here, I'm gonna, I know that's gonna take the music away from you. I feel bad because the music's so good. But I have played Citizen Sleeper for a total of 25 and a half hours, apparently. And 
Like, there are still achievements that I haven't gotten for the game, right? Like, there's absolutely one for uh, the bounty hunter, Nathan. That was his name, right? Nathan? Now I can't remember. Dingus, where you can, if you actually go through his entire storyline, you know, there's an achievement for that. But then apparently there's five more hidden achievements I haven't triggered yet. And I don't know what those are. I assume they have to do with game endings. Um, <sighs> yeah. Honestly, I hope that you don't see any of the characters that you saw in the first Citizen Sleeper in the sequel. Space is big. Space is ridiculously big. Um, I would be fine with never seeing any of them again. I'm so glad that Emphis, because I become the proprietor of the Bentian, that I'm able to get Emphis in there to be my cook. Which is the only thing I wanted the entire damn game. <laughs> uh, so I'm glad that worked out. Uh, you know, there's... <sighs> yeah, so good. I'm so glad that the Flux storyline like also brought back all of the previous characters that we had done stuff with. So that we could interact with them again. Like that was nice. Um, right. So. We. I had suggested. Excuse me. I had suggested that next. Navigator did help. Navigator's great. Um. I had said that we would be playing Mech Warrior 5 uh, Mercenaries next. Um, we've got a lot of options for campaigns to choose from, um, which we'll go over Saturday, I guess. Um, the actual campaign lengths, I don't remember being like each individual like story beat isn't necessarily too long but there's a lot of downtime in mech warrior if that makes any sense where you have to like hop around a bit but i think that's fine um we'll have to pick our starting point though and go from there uh let's see what else i do have other games that i would like to show off i had said um the surge right want to show that off uh i was able to i think i mentioned this i found bionic commando rearmed which is the remastered bionic commando game which is hilarious then there's the 3d bionic commando which is also hilarious um grappling hook games and then there's uh, let's see, I picked up as well because I was weak during sale time. Um, Titanfall 2, because Titanfall 1 is not available, but it's a mech game. And I like giant robots. Uh, and it was like three bucks on sale. And then I picked up Sanabi, which is a 2D side scroller grappling hook traversal game which i have watched someone else play and it is stunningly good looking for a pixel art game like just the amount of artistry on display is ridiculous um and it looks cool so but like i said mech warrior 5 mercenaries first we will pick one of the campaigns to start from i believe uh if drew is present the answer will be russell hog russell hog russell hog um 
which I mean, sure, let's be clear. Every one of the houses sucks out loud. Um, much like in Citizen Sleeper, none of the corporations are good for you. None of the royalist houses are good for you. Uh, don't be surprised. Um, and yeah. Yeah. There's a lot. There's a lot. Um, but yeah, I said I was going to play some Mech Warrior. And then I said I wanted to play at least the intro to The Surge. I don't know if I'm good enough to play The Surge all the way through or if I have enough patience um, to do that. But the intro segment of that game alone is... They take bigger swings in that intro segment than a lot of AAA games take ever in their entire runtime. Um, and I just wish that more games did. Um, but yeah, next, Mech Warrior 5. Then The Surge. Then we'll talk about what's after that. Uh, we might do a run on grappling hook games, right? Do Bionic Commando Rearmed, then do Bionic Commando, then do Sanabi, then... I've seen some other grappling hook games. Uh, maybe go back and play a run of Gravity Circuit, because that's a grappling hook game. Um, <laughs> grappling hooks are the superior way to travel in video games. Um, plain and simple. Spider-Man's a grappling hook game, correct. It's just a specialized grappling hook. Uh, I would have to get new Spider-Man for that to happen. Like, I'd have to get Spider-Man Miles Morales or Spider-Man 2 or whatever. Oh, right. <sighs> I need to decide if I'm also going to uh, buy the first Dragon's Dogma, which constantly goes on sale for, like, less than four bucks, before playing Dragon's Dogma 2, because Dragon's Dogma 1 has, again, one of the best intro sequences I've ever seen in a video game before, and I just wish more video games would be like, hey, this is why your character's here and what they're up to. Um, does whatever a Spider-Man can? Oh, jeez. I thought it was just whatever a spider can. Like, th th that sounds like a tautology. <laughs> Ratchet and Clank. Ratchet and Clank games have grappling hooks. I love Ratchet and Clank. Uh, let's see, let's see. What else has a good grappling hook? What do I have in my library that's got a good grappling hook? Uh... Hard Space Shipbreaker's got a grappling hook. It's just actually meant for grappling other objects. Oh, does that? I never got very far in Odin Sphere. Maybe I should try that game again. Get the updated version. So the graphics will look... The graphics will be given the treatment they deserve. Oh, right, but I had also threatened, now speaking of graphics, I remember, of course, I had threatened you all with Breath of Fire 5 Dragon Quarter because it being the fifth one and talking about quarters of things makes it really easy to forget the name. Okay, okay, hold on, 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 hold on. That's just rude to call me out like that. Because I said I didn't want to chain cats. What I didn't want to do was buy the sequel to Cat Quest and the following sequel to Cat Quest. And then I didn't want to play Stray right away. Maybe that's what we do. I'm entertained by grappling hook games, though, right? Like, this is this is the thing. Like, the idea of grappling hook games is just ridiculous to me because it's a silly theme. But I guess so is cats. Yeah, right, exactly. If the game had had a cat with a grappling hook, 
Like, truly, it's just bad game design at that point. <laughs> um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, none of those. None of those. Like, Tunic had a grappling hook, kind of. Look, it was just an entity that we trapped in an orb that uh, we used its tendrils to fling us places. It's fine. Um, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. There's so many options for games. It never ends. I don't know. Citizen Sleeper is also kind of heavy. Maybe, well, no, I said Mech Warrior. We're definitely sticking with Mech Warrior. The Surge is also heavy. All of these games I'm talking about are heavy. Oh my gosh. Oh no. Maybe I've made a mistake. Maybe I've made a terrible mistake. Uh, oh no. Oh no. No, every game I've been looking at, though, is, right? Like, Mech Warrior is you are a mercenary leader, which means inherently you take money to kill other people, to take other things from other people by force. Uh, not even for yourself, just for a payday. Ugh. Uh, after that, I said The Surge. I believe I talked about how that game's heavy. Like, don't trust Elon Musk to put a computer chip in your brain. It's absolutely not going to turn out well. Um, Bionic Commando Remastered, which was the one I talked about doing after that. I want to be clear. I don't even know how to say it. In a world where the evil organization is trying to resurrect <laughs> the dicta a World War II dictator to try to take over the world, the only person we found to save us is some guy who can't even jump. Uh... Uh, yes, Bionic Commando can be heavy if you kill uh, Robot Hitler. Um, I mean, by definition, that's pretty heavy. Like, you are being sent in to rescue prisoners of war. Like, to be clear, also, like, you're a disabled person. Your arm has been replaced with a mechanical, a mechanical grappling hook. That's pretty messed up. Yes, two-thirds the dimensions. Um, you know, the fully 3D Bionic Commando game is even worse because after the first game, you get put in prison. Sanabi <laughs> uh, is heavy as all hell. Oh, God, that game's heavy. Maybe I am feeling heavy. But also, maybe I should instead look for a thematic palate cleanser. I'll think on that. Yeah, I'm going to think on that. Anyway, thanks so much for hanging out. I'm glad you enjoyed the story. And uh, we'll see you on Saturday. Bye.